Welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, where today we will continue our discussion of Chapter 2 of Whither Are We Traveling by Dwight Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our thoughts and opinions are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions via our website at theworkingtoolspodcast.com. Today on the Working Tools Podcast, we have our usual gang of hosts, uh, Worshipful Brother Jared Dunham of Penticton 147 in Penticton, British Columbia, very Worshipful Brother David Colbeth from King Solomon Number 60 in Auburn, Washington, Worshipful Brother Stephen Chung from Prince Charles 153 in Kelowna, British Columbia, and I'm Matt Apple from Mill Creek Number 243 in lovely Mont Lake Terrace, Washington. And uh, we left off with... Jared, our last episode, and so we're discussing chapter two, just to be clear, uh, the level of leadership um, for the, this article by by past Grandmaster Dwight Smith. And and uh, as you will recall in our previous episode, the, the story of the film so far, Jared was had ominously said something along the lines of, and another thing, and then we, we cut him off. So, <laughs> sir, what is it you wish to say? Well, it was just with his point three, where he says, you know, Freemas- Freemasonry is to command respect. Um, you know, the master's hat must be one who can, who can command respect. And I found it interesting in that near to this, near the end, he says, uh, if he is not a man upon whom intelligent people may look with admiration. And I mean, that sounded a bit nasty. And like, I don't think, you know, is he calling everyone stupid? But hearing that also make me remember my Anderson's constitutions, where we say that we will not make a stupid atheist a mason. And so it, it brings me to the and and having recently gone uh, participated in a third in a master mason degree and a fellow craft degree and we the whole intelli- you know uh, the emphasis at least that our ritual up here that Stephen and I do puts on education and improving ourselves through education and I just found it interesting that you know he's talking about so. Not only are you expecting, you know, your masters to be leaders in the community, but they have to be smart leaders in the community because, you know, we don't want dumb, poor leaders. And it just the 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 for me, the tick the boxes that you have to tick to be master of your lodge for worshipful brother Smith to be happy. He seems to be looking for a very specific, very small group of people that can lead your lodge. And it felt, I, I mean, I'm not going to say that it felt elitist because that just would be the wrong word to use in Freemasonry, but it felt like he was looking, it, it once again, as I said in the last episode, it felt like he was wait, He was looking for someone who had already perfected their Ashler before they even knocked on the West Gate. I, I was just wondering what your opinions were of that. Well, I, I, I think a lot of it, as we've read through it, and now focusing on a certain area of the of the various articles there's a lot of it that he's coming from an era where there was uh i don't know was it 500 percent increase in membership a huge increase in membership after the wars and so now there's this massive influx of new people that maybe shouldn't have been involved and so i think i, I think i hear that through the words some of the words he's describing and talking about leadership and also talking about intelligence and other things <clears throat> but and so he, but he also has this vast number even though it's declining <laughs> vast number of members to to select from and so i think he is it probably does have a little bit of the right to say yeah i'm looking out of these 500 members in our in our lodge there, there's probably only 20 that qualify when you only have 20 members in your lodge maybe there's one that qualifies <laughs> or none i mean officially by his standards and so I think still going back to the idea of expectations and and not loyalty so much, but expectations, I think we should expect certain things from our members and from those coming in. And so through our, what he didn't have back then, but we have now the six steps programs and things like that, we're a little more selective. And so hopefully we're getting a little better quality of men in than we used to even before. 
except me, but you know, they didn't have that when I joined. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Imagine the process I would have had to have gone through, man. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm a legacy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. And like we were talking about earlier too, the idea of the quality of the men were the higher standard of people in the community. Well, when masonry is formed, it that was just the men. I mean, it was just whoever was there. It wasn't necessarily. And and was it? It was an elitist. It was maybe an elitist group when it was first formed, or at least when it was expanding into new communities and new areas into the West and things. Yeah, maybe the sheriff and the mayor and the city leaders and whatever were part of Freemasonry at the time. But I would bet that they included some of the ruffians as well, even though they were leaders, maybe not the ditch digger necessarily, but maybe who knows if he was in charge of the other ditch diggers, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, or grave diggers. But I think that there, there was, it was a little bit of a separation, maybe not on purpose, but there was a natural draw for the leaders to be part of the organization. Cause it was kind of the only game in town organized. They didn't have rotary and all those other things back then necessarily. And so over the years it's changed, but I don't know. I, I I do think that, at least for us anyway, my lodge and maybe in in general, true more true community engagement, and not just placating to oh yeah we were in that parade or yeah we, you know give this award out to somebody or we give scholarships out. What does community engagement really mean? And does community engagement mean that you have to do it as a lodge? No, I, I think he points that out here. I don't think that he, he's saying that the lodge itself, but the master, he being an individual, should probably be recognized. And or I think you could even take out the word master and you could just say a member of the lodge. As a member of the lodge, you should be looked at. Like kind of like what, what Matt what you said earlier, that we all want to be like Jared, right? If we, we should be able to see Jared out in the community and go, oh, he's he's awesome. He's involved. He's active. He's articulate. All these things. What is it that makes Jared like that? I want to. I want to get to. I want to be like Jared. I want to get that T-shirt that says, "I want to be like Jared." <laughs> but be <right>. XL, please. <laughs> but <laughs> actually, it would be kind of cool because we could have a side profile of him in a white. You know. Anyway, <laughs> really, I just want to be able to grow that beard <laughs> with the beard and the glasses. I think it would be awesome, right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so. What I, I just so this also leads me to another question, and one of the things that I wanted us when we discussing this is, have we progressed in sixty years? Like I know that, I mean, for one thing, I know that our our education system, like we educate. So I mean, is that making better people? You know, for us to choose from, but I mean, like because he's white, complaining about the leadership in his lodge. In 1962, if you look around your district, are, have we made progress? You know, can we honestly say that we're doing a better job? And if we're not doing a better job, why, why still not? So I, so this is where, if you were to ask me if it matters how many Masons there are in the world, I would think on a grand scheme of things level i would say no that you know a small lodge or a small group of masons is fine we're working on ourselves go away but there's another part of me that says one of the reasons why you do need numbers is you run into what i what i call in, uh, is the the warm bodies problem you need someone to be master right and there's the, the paragraph above you were saying about point three, the, the last paragraph in point two talks about shortening the line of officers in order to, to uh, accommodate if you have a leader that you want to, you know, why aren't we just making a master kind of thing? And I think you, well, that has a separate problem to it too, but part of the problem is that you, you need someone to be master, right? And no one that I know of wants to be master for eight years in a row while we wait to find someone new and then have them go through the line. And that problem is the, the, the problem with the numbers is that problem in essence. 
Yeah, and I, I, I think I, I don't remember. I don't think it's in this articles that we've read. Maybe it's I've I, you know, the idea of the progressive line. I guess it was in the observing the craft. The idea of the progressive line is not only innovation but also something we should probably disregard. And so, I, I said that you shouldn't. When it, the idea of fast tracking somebody through the chairs may be valid if he already has a set of skills and he can already handle proficiency quickly. But I'm not talking, you know, from master mason to master or master mason to senior warden. I mean, maybe master mason to junior deacon or senior deacon. So he doesn't have to go through, you know, the stewards and marshals and some lodges say, nope, you got to start as chaplain and then you or whatever marshal and you have to work your way nine years up to the east no matter what. And is there a purpose for that? Maybe there is. And I, my note was that does, if he does do it in less than three or four years, has he learned the culture of the lodge and has he learned, there is an important factor there, but I think a guy could learn that in three or four years. And so I, I'm not, I don't agree with putting somebody in immediately as junior warden or senior warden. If he's a you know, new master, a new master Mason, but if he's had some outside leadership skills, if he obviously presents himself as a leader I don't have any problem putting him in as junior deacon or senior deacon to get started, so to speak. But I think he needs three or four years to learn the culture and learn about masonry and how things work and the interactions between guys. He needs to build, develop friendships and relationships a little bit. I think the important th point you've pointed there is that there's more to learning. There's more to going through the line than just ritual work and stuff. There's You have to learn how your jurisdiction works, what the protocols are for your lodge, for another... But I think I always get upset when people say we've got to get rid of the progressive line. What we've got to get rid of is an automatic progression. Yeah. yeah. Like the, here, here. the line is always, the line needs to be progressive. What we need to do is take, you know, eliminate the, and I don't know how you do it. Like if someone gets elected to a chair, say senior deacon, and they just do not perform their duty well, they should not be promoted. Right. Either you hold, I mean, I know it sounds like we're talking about students in high school, but they should be, you know, either. And, but then, then you start, this is, I promise I've thought about this like Matt, when I'm lying in bed at night, you know, listening to my children snore. I mean, no. And, oh, they're, they're going to kill me now. Um, but you sit there and it's like, okay, so you get someone who's stuck in a chair, right? And like that had, they've been elected. They haven't done their job really well. Do you keep them there to give them another year? What about the person behind them who may have done their job well that really wants to progress? And then also you have the issue of, well, if they don't progress, you've got a whole chair to fill. How do you feel? Like so I don't, I don't, I know it's not easy, but I really think we should be less willing because it's Matt's warm body problem again, is that we need to be less willing to progress someone who hasn't shown they should progress. And I, 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 and I know I put this onus on the past masters need to be willing to just step in when there's a hole that needs to be filled. Um, unfortunately, if you're in a lodge like mine, almost everyone is a past master. So, but that's the, that's a membership issue to be dealt with, with all of these other issues is that, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have new people to go through the line, you know, it, you, that's your, pro, you, you need to focus on. We, you need to focus on that problem before you start focusing on other things. And is there any issue if a guy does a really great job and the lodge wants him to, and he is okay with staying as master or staying a senior warden or staying in a particular position and guys, if he's not master, if he's a warden or somewhere else, is it okay if he stays there and guys kind of skip around him, so to speak, or should he step out to allow somebody to have that experience? Well, that's the thing is that I would, you know, having gone through the line, I would think, especially senior warden, you need that year standing, sitting on the other side at, you know, exact opposite to your master to to have that experience of, you know, opening and closing and all the stuff that you have to do. Yeah. I, 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 I personally, myself, dislike the concept of skipping chairs. Um, I also, you know, so yeah, I, I would say no, I would, but I, I agree with you. Like if someone's doing a really good job. If someone's doing a really good job of master and you don't have someone say in senior warden, like it's a, it's a past master. I see no issue if someone is sitting in the East doing a good job in the East, staying in the East for another year if they want to. 
or if someone's doing it, like if you've got a senior deacon who enjoy does their job really well and the junior deacon is once again, a past master, there's no one that needs to progress past them. I don't see any reason why you can't. You what about know? changing it to two year terms? But okay. So that sounds great, except that you've got someone who is that going to discourage someone from going to the chairs because it's going to take them too long to get through. And then, you know, who may do a good job, but just doesn't want to take two years in each chair. I've actually thought about suggesting a, um, uh, a, uh, amendment to the code to that effect that, that the, uh, that for the grand line that it would take them each two years, but then you're talking a, literally a 10 year commitment when you get elected to the grand South and that's a lot. That is a, a big lot. There are, I know there's some jurisdiction back East and I know I, I, that's a line I probably say entirely too often in this show, but there's another jurisdiction somewhere. I, I, I want to say Massachusetts, but somewhere back East that they actually, they hold elections every year for the grand line. But the custom is that the people get reelected one time. So there is that opportunity to, to unelect your grandmaster if, if you don't think he's doing a good job or the grand senior warden or whoever, but the custom is that if they're not doing a crappy job, they get reelected to that role for the second time. So I thought that one was interesting. How about this concept? And this is having brought up the SCA recently in, in the SCA, we have officers and stuff and we, but we have royalty and it's every six months we hold a tournament to decide who gets to sit as King and queen of our area. So would it be, maybe we should shorten the terms would being master for only six months out of the year help with this? Okay, so I'm I'm thinking pairing um, a duel with ritual knowledge, and now we're having like Masonic poetry slam competitions <laughs> to see who's going to be master next. One time we, we have a traveling gavel that goes around, and there was you have to have five master masons, and uh, and uh, whoever outranks it, there's some criteria that kind of anyway we were at a lodge and they all was, everything was equal. And so my master said, I'll leg wrestle you for it. <laughs> it was actually a great event. We had lots of pictures. It was funny, but uh, we, he lamented and gave the gavel, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the magic answer is. I think I agree completely that a past master's role is to assist the lodge, which may mean sitting in a chair. And I love the idea that, if a guy, maybe it's only for one year, maybe the master does stay there. I hadn't really thought about that. I, I guess that assumption was that the past master would fill a hold and he would just move to the next station and then be master again. But, you know, I, I would fill a role not to be master again to let the, you know, to have the current master stay there if he, if he likes doing it. You know, I guess some guys like it, some guys don't too. We ended up with a, a hole in the line. So I ended up serving another year as junior warden, but didn't necessarily have any desires to continue that and go into senior and, and be master again. I just was filling the law, filling the hole where it needed to be filled. So in our remaining few moments, I've got a question. I don't know if you, if we can figure this out in the next five minutes here, 10 minutes, but what are the characteristics of a leader that we would want or expect Organized. According, according to him it looks like the top skills are leadership engagement and proficiency at least those are the three he fed us for debate but you said organization well knowing yeah being being showing up well because he talks about i think he talks about showing up to a meeting knowing what you need to do and doing it so you know and knowing knowing how i guess the other one is delegation is being able to and and holding your your other lodge officers to their roles. You know, it's it's all well and good to sit in the east, but you really sometimes are herding cats. Yeah, sometimes I, I have been to so many Masonic meetings where I just wish before the meeting started, the guy in charge had for five minutes sat and thought, what are we gonna do today? Huh. I wonder if we, you know, work the ballot on a new guy. Well that and just just yes a level of I, I i forget how you you phrased it just now commitment and interest in what's going on 
to to care about the rest of us. And I, and I think too, like Jared's mentioned before, that we should, as good past masters, we should know the lodge culture well enough and hopefully know that master well enough to be able to assist him in advancing his, I would say, I hate to say agenda, but his actual agenda for the meeting, if he has one, hopefully, uh, that, but the progression of the meeting, so it doesn't stagnate, you know, move it along. Let's, let's, and that might need facilitation in some lodges, like in our bylaws, it was, it was going to take a long time to get through. And so I just said, I moved that we pass as is basically. And then it prompted guys to say, wait a minute, let's work through this. And so we just kind of worked through it. It was an hour, hour and a half of discussion about the bylaws. But if, you know, it sometimes it needs uh, some experience or some, a, a catalyst uh, to get things moving. And it was like, even our temple board, our president was gone and nobody wanted to run. And I said, I'll do it. And bang, I just boom, 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 boom. We were done in a half hour instead of hour and a half normally. And so I think you just need somebody sometimes to be able to assist, but you have to have that, that relationship with that master. If you're there, if they are having some difficulty and you have to understand how they work though, to be able to help them. Well, yeah, so, the, you definitely need to be able to, to guide gently, mm -hmm. but and be able to be willing and able after a meeting, if it has gone off the rails, to say to them, next month, we need it to be tighter. Can maybe I offer some suggestions on how to do that? And so should we, we should meet with them yeah. probably and try and help them. Because yeah. the, the worst thing we the worst thing that we do right now, I see in Lodge is Placate, not, placate isn't the right word I want to use. We we tell people they're doing a good job when they're not actually doing a good job <laughs> because we don't want to hurt their feelings. Yeah. You know, we, we, it, it's okay to say to some, you know, that was good, but you know, we need a little bit more. In that case, Jared, I've got some pointers. <laughs> uh, lay it on <laughs> me, brother. I, I stole a line from somebody years ago, step on their shoes while straightening their tie. And I say it often enough. People have started to say it now. So I feel pretty good. That must be, you know, they must appreciate that. But yeah, step, try and step on their shoes while straightening their tie. And that's a little bit like we are supposed to be ours masons. We're supposed to whisper kind advice into an ear of a erring brother. And I think sometimes we're afraid to do that. I think we're afraid that what might happen. And I think we need to not be afraid of that because we're supposed to be able to have those kind of conversations on a level. It's okay for sometimes for people to not like you as long as they accept that. Well, as long as they're willing to accept that maybe what you're saying is true. You know, sometimes you do have to be the bad boy, bad guy. Sorry, not the bad boy. <laughs> That's a very different podcast. <laughs> so I've, I've had a, a flash of mediocrity while we were sitting here. Um, someone gave it, I think was asking what the right size of the lodge was. And I, think the answer in my head now is, and it's going to be circular and nonsensical, something along the lines of there's enough Masons to do all the work and enough work for all the Masons to be involved. Mm. So there you go. There's my meaningless but deep sounding thought for the evening. <laughs> I say that's pretty deep, buddy. So with that, um, I think we've, we've rounded up our discussion of chapter two of Whither Are We Traveling. Uh, we look forward to discussing chapters three through 11 with you uh, shortly. And again, uh, please feel free to comment and let us know your thoughts on this article and our conversation. And we look forward to hearing from you on the Working Tools podcast. Goodbye. Goodbye.